Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, First Service Williams, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal & Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling & Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moynian Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. Welcome to Building New York. You know, it's, it's really interesting to have a person on a show who really is responsible for the show. About seven years ago, an individual by the name of James Orfanides came there and, and said, you know, I'll help you create a radio show, which then became one TV show and then became a second TV show. And James Orfanides, who retired as the chairman of the board, president and CEO of First American Title Insurance Company, who is the chairman and president of Orfanides and Associates, a real estate investment banking firm, is a dear friend and my guest today on Building New York. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me today, too. So, you know, Jim, you know, I, I always like the fact that I'm a Brooklyn boy, you're a Queens boy. You were born in Queens. You grew up where? Forest Hills? Yes, I grew up in Forest Hills, Queens. And just so we, we know, even though you and I are very good friends, kids from Queens usually don't hang out with kids from Brooklyn. I, I realize that, but, <laughs> but let, let, let's talk about that. You know, you know, you have two brothers, you know, who are both doctors, one who's a gastroenterologist, one who's a PhD, and, and you know, they're the you, smart ones. They're the smart ones. Okay. <laughs> so, so what happens is you grow up in Queens, you go to public school, uh, and then at 12 years of age, you really learn about business because your first job was uh, delivering uh, the newspaper, right? You had the, the, the New York, the New York, York World, World Tele Telegram. And, yes, I absolutely. mean, there are not too many newspapers left. Uh, so, so, but you, you have a very interesting career path. Why don't you tell my audience about you know, the newspapers, which then go to, to the Chinese restaurant later on in the candy store. So go over well, it. Well, let me uh, just start by saying um, I was never a really good student in school. Uh, so I filled much of my uh, after school activities instead of doing homework, which a lot of other people uh, were either compelled to do or wanted to do or liked to do. Um, I found uh, a different kind of activity that uh, supplemented my academic world, and that was I went to work. And I went to work uh, by taking over a newspaper out in my seven building apartment complex in Forest Hills on 113th Street. And um, it was, uh, we started with 20 papers being delivered, you would get six papers for the cost of 50 cents. So you got a free paper uh, every week. But you know, very interesting, that's how you really learn the real estate business because you walked around a lot of property. I did walk around a lot of property. I knew apartments before I understood apartments. Uh, and I grew up in one, so I was a cave dweller most of my, uh, most of my childhood. But um, in doing that, I rang bells to try to supplement and build the, uh, the route. And uh, in my building, I started with 20, and two years later, uh, there were over 200 papers being delivered in that seven-building complex. I just about had everybody in the complex 
getting the newspaper. So, so then you went from delivering the newspapers to making the Sunday newspaper in the candy store. Well, no. Before that, I worked in a dry cleaning store after school uh, for two and a half to three years. And um, uh, afternoons, I would go right after school and then close the shop at night because the owner would then go to the other store in Regal Park down on Queens Boulevard and he would finish there. And when my mother found out that I was the guy closing the store and taking the bag of money and putting it into the mail drop, she got a little bit upset uh, saying, I think that's a little too much for a kid that's not even 15 years old to be doing. So um, I think uh, we moved on and that's one of the reasons why I transitioned into the candy store. You go to work at the Chinese restaurant? Chen's Jade East, and, and, Parker and, and, Towers uh, and, and, in Forest Hills. And, and, and Chen's Jade East, you had a variety of jobs, right? Yes, I initially was the um, the delivery boy, uh, but I also was in the kitchen. I did the dishes. I was the dishwasher, and I enjoyed making the uh, shrimp egg rolls in the deep fryer. And I would do the uh, fantail shrimp there. And uh, and uh, then every, every night after the store shop closed and the restaurant was closed, we would have a Thanksgiving dinner. Mrs. Chen would cook for all of, the, all of the staff a dinner that was a Thanksgiving feast every night. So it was, uh, I never went home hungry, that's for sure. So, so now you graduate high school. I delivered uh, groceries during the, the days, and uh, we were really meant to be dispatchers between the stores to bring produce when there was a shortage from one store to the other. Uh, one time, we ended up having to go out to a store in uh, Jackson Heights and pick up 100 watermelons and then deliver them to a place out in Long Island. I forgot where exactly. And, um, and two or three of the watermelons uh, you know, got damaged on the way. Um, and when we delivered the watermelons to uh, the, the storekeeper, he said, how come there's only 97? I said, well, three were destroyed. I didn't think you'd want the three that are destroyed. He said, you sure you're not keeping them in the truck? I said, sir, they are not in the truck. Go out and take a look. And he saw the three watermelons on, the, on it. And he then told us, uh, guys, uh, take whatever you want from the store. Have lunch on us and, uh, and enjoy. And that's one, one little story. So now you graduate. You graduate high school. Where did you go? Forest Hiding? Forest, Forest Hills High School. And now, Horace Hiding was a different competitor. Right. Okay. And you graduate high school. And then he said to me, you end up in in Tilden, Ohio? No, Tiffin, Ohio. Tiffin, Ohio. Tiffin, I, went, Ohio. I went to a small Ohio school, um, one of those many Lutheran-based uh, religious schools, uh, Heidelberg College, which is the brother university of the one in Germany, very well known to most people in the world. Um, and it was uh, 30 miles south of Toledo and 30 miles east of the Indiana border. And it was a uh, total population for all four years of just about 1,000 students. Now, the interesting thing is that your dad, before he went to law school, uh, went to the same college. Yes, I ended up finding Heidelberg because I was initially thinking of going to uh, Queensboro Community College or Queens College, depending on whether or not I would be admitted in, in the September uh, semester. Uh, and everything was done based on GPA at that time and, and um, SAT scores. So um, my dad said, Jim, you've been working since you're you know 12 years old. You're going to be working for probably the rest of your life. Why don't you go uh, away to school and have that experience so that at least you can um, have a different perspective. Um, you know, a kid from Queens in New York, you know, what did I know about Ohio other than the whole family came from Ohio? Um, but um, so I went, it was one of the few times I actually listened to my dad and, and, and did, but you, and but did later what Later on, you listened to your dad also. But let's, yes. so, so you go there, and during the summers over there, for the first two years, you work at the U.S. Post Office. Yes. I, you're not allowed to work in your zone, your zip code, so I couldn't work in the Forest Hills uh, Post Office. But I worked uh, at uh, the Regal Park Post Office, which was, which was just on Horace Harding Boulevard and Queens Boulevard. Now, now, the interesting aside, which my viewers will be surprised, that I worked in the post office, but only during the mail strike of the 1970s when I was in the Army Reserve. And, and because of my Army Reserve abilities, I lost one year of active duty because I served for four days at the post office. So I, I like the post office story very much. So, so now, now it, it, it's time... It's, you, while you're still there, you really get into, because what, what people don't understand and why I wanted to have you on Building in New York, is the, the, the subject of title insurance. I mean, you spent your entire career really starting when you were 20 years of age getting a job uh, in your third and fourth year of college in the title insurance business. And we were talking when we got together the other day what is title insurance and, and why is it so important? Because everything over here relates to title insurance. Everyone in that picture, 
the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. Let's go over that. Well, uh, I, I mentioned one of my former colleagues uh, was, uh, was usually articulating that he felt the title insurance was after the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the most important document that anybody could ever possess, which is title to their property, title to their, to their home. Uh, I mean, it's the American dream in, 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 in total fulfillment across the land. Uh, owning your own home is, is the, is the pursuit of, of all of our ancestors that came to this country. Uh, this was the place where the freedom that you were given was, was not given freely, but it was one that you, you certainly earned through your hard work and the initiatives that people made. And, and the title insurance industry basically arrived because of the lawsuits that existed among the people in the 19th century. Um, and great story about uh, President Abraham Lincoln was that here's a person that uh, lost his home three times before he was uh, a lawyer and before he went on to the White House. So uh, had they had title insurance, maybe we could have done something about that and, and let Abe maybe, st but then he may not have moved to Illinois. So who knows if it weren't for yeah, the, Timing is everything. Timing so, is everything. So, so it really relates, but in the third year, you know, something you did listen to your dad, again, was over here, your dad, who was a real estate, who's still alive, Gus, Augusto, who uh, you, you decide, he says, look, Jim, it's good to get into the title insurance business. He was a real estate and estate attorney, and he said, learn this trade, right? So the, you, you work the summers. Well, yeah, he, he, he guided me into thinking that uh, the job market was never so promising in the early 70s. Vietnam was still going on. Uh, I received a very high draft lottery number. It was most unlikely I would be drafted. I'd have to make the decision. By the time I graduated, the war was waning anyway, and it was winding down substantially. But notwithstanding, um, my dad said, learn this trade, because if you move to any part of the country, you might be able to practice this trade. And it was teaching, him, teaching me how to search and examine titles, which, uh, other than a few differences in different states, is pretty much modeled in the same system, uh, which goes back to you know the common laws and the, and, and the system that was derived from the Magna Carta, actually, uh, going all the way back. So the title insurance in in industry is one where it's living history. Every piece of property has a historical record to it. And it's that record that is the essence of, of sometimes the stories that are behind the scenes that very rarely get told. So it's, there are some exciting stories about Which we'll real estate. we'll get to in a little while. Okay. So, so you graduate college. Right. And you wanted to then go, you were thinking about going for your master's in political science. Well, actually, I was hoping to go for my doctorate. No, you, you know, you're hoping for the doctorate, but you wanted uh, definitely the master's over there. And then what happened? You graduated in June. You subsequently got married in April to a woman who you met when you were 15, when she was 14, Nora, the mother of all your, your children. Tell us how you met Nora. Well, okay. Um, Nora and I met at a uh, church camp on uh, Valentine's weekend in 1966. Um, and I was 15, Nora was still 14, uh, and um, we, I, I, I don't know what the today's term is, but we, we got together as a, our youth group and her youth group. Uh, she was from the Queens Village Reformed Church. I was going to the um, Kew Gardens Reformed Church, and um, you know we were all up there, and we got together, and, and, and I had never really had a girlfriend before that, other than I would say the only you know, girl I really ever uh, spent any time with was my mother and my, my grandmother, my yaya, who lived with us. And, uh, there were six of us, by the way, in that apartment that we grew up in, which was a large one bedroom. My two brothers, myself, my father, my mother, and my mother's mother. And, uh, and you know, while it was small and tight, uh, we didn't realize that we were living in a one bedroom apartment. It seemed like pro plenty of room for all of us. And it was a great life that we had, and we were happy in our home. But back to meeting Nora, um, we didn't immediately start dating, uh, but my, my wife tells the story that she decided to have a, uh, a youth group dance at her church and invited other youth groups, and hopefully mine was one that went there. And uh, when we got together again, we started dating that spring, that summer of 66. And we're, uh, you know, a few years later, uh, became husband and wife after we graduated college, so after you, I graduated college. Okay, so you graduated college, Nora's going for uh, speech pathology. And audiology. And, and, and audiology. And the, the job that you get immediately after college is where? Okay, uh, I started to work for Home Title, which is now known as Chicago Title Insurance Company. Um, Home Title Insurance Company was uh, located, in this case, the office I was working for the two summers before as a searcher examiner uh, was in Jamaica, Queens on 150th Street in Parsons. And um, 
uh, I started working as a full-time search and examiner because I needed a job because in our spring break of my senior year, which was also Nora's senior year, but she had a three-semester senior year, we decided to get married. And all my plans to go to Washington, D.C. to graduate school were now put on hold. And uh, ergo, I needed a job as a married uh, guy, and my wife needed one more semester. And then we'd reevaluate what we'd do. So, so you're still working in the title insurance, and, you, and you're planning to go for your doctorate, but you're going for your master's at Queens College at this time. That's correct. And what happens is you find out next year that there's, a, there's Mark is going to be on the way. Your, your oldest right. son, Mark, who lives in Oregon, who works for Nike, right? Right, that's correct. So, so, uh, and so that was a little change, and it was time to move also for a lot. Not yet. Not, Not yet, yet, right. Not this yet. Next apartment. You live in Corona at this time. We're living in Corona on 97th Street. Okay. Then, then you continue working up the ranks, and uh, then you... You go to Chicago, then you get to work in Long Island, right? I go from the Jamaica office to the Long Island office, and then in a then, year and a half. Then you really get up there. You go into the Woolworth building over here. That's correct. Okay, and you, and you go over there. But then you find out, uh, you're about 24 and a half, you find out that Elaine is on the way, right? So, yeah. So, so Elaine's on the way. Nora tells you we're going to have two. And the apartment in Corona is a little too small for that. The apartment in Forest Hills made the apartment in Corona... Uh, looked like it was a luxury. Uh, uh, Forest Hills apartment was 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 a palace next to the Corona apartment. So, so uh, now uh, let's understand. Boys from Brooklyn and Queens really never knew what New Jersey was. You end up in Twin Rivers, New Jersey. That's uh, great. Uh, you know, I remember when I was in the Army Reserve, everybody would run to try to get an apartment at Twin Rivers because it was a great bargain. It, That's right. It, it, was, it was truly a great bargain. And so this guy who's 25 years of age ends up on exit eight, not exit. At 8A in you know in East Windsor, New Jersey, in Twin Rivers. That's and you right. Buy a home. We buy a home, and, and, and I was able to buy this two-bedroom uh, townhouse home with five thousand uh, dollars, and that was where we, we all did that at that time in our lives. We drove to where you could afford to to buy. Um, the commute was certainly now much different. While it did take almost an hour to go from Corona to downtown Manhattan at the Woolworth Building with the, ser the series of trains that you'd have to take, um, it would de definitely now be at least an hour and a half because the bus ride minimally, without any traffic or delays, was at least an hour because it was over 60 miles from Twin Rivers to Midtown Port Authority. Oh, so you took the bus. You didn't, you didn't take the at train. That at that time, it was the bus. It was the bus. Later on, you got fancy and you got to the train yes. in Princeton yes. Junction. Yeah. So, so let, let's continue on. You know, I, and I think the interesting thing is, you know, you, you met a couple of guys, Marty Dembski, Bill, uh, Bill Saganic, Bill Saganic and, and really, you go into business on your own with your colleagues in what year? Well. Um, in, in 1979, Marty Dembski and I leave Chicago title, uh, and uh, Marty and I have now been with Bill Saganic from 1974 to 1979. Basically, we were referred to as the Three Musketeers. Uh, we built up a very large practice and business uh, in the title insurance segment, uh, insuring most of the commercial real estate activity throughout the United States, and, and we also then became active here in New York City. Uh, after that, uh, Marty and I left to go to Commonwealth Land Title Insurance Company uh, that was over at 1290 Avenue of the Americas, and uh, we started the national division for, Chicago, for Commonwealth Land Title at that time in New York. So Marty and I grew that business from 1979 to 1982, and in 1982, we joined two of our former colleagues that were from Chicago Title. Now, I have to remember, when was Janine bought? Janine was born in 1983. Okay, okay. So, so at least now uh, uh, Janine was born when you were a, an entrepreneur now. I mean, you were always an entrepreneur. Well, yes. Okay, yes. you and Marty, and you start this, this, this common uh, preferred land. Preferred which is, land. Which was an agent of First American Title Insurance Company of, of, New, of York. New York. That's right. Uh, a subsidiary of, the, of this company, First American Title Insurance Company of, of California. That's correct. And... You spend, you, you spend basically, you know, you go there as the EVP, you then become the president a year later, then you become chairman, president, and everything. At that time, you go from a company that's doing $20 million, and when you retired in December 31, 2007, the company had $250 million in assets. That's correct. Uh, so but, so, so let, let, let's really get to the time, because the key is what title insurance and what you've done is that... As you said, Abe Lincoln lost his house because he didn't have title insurance. But there were certain transactions. You know, th this, we, we omit showing over here 
you know, uh, I think maybe at the end, we do have it over there, we show Battery Park City, sure. which, w which was an interesting thing, because how do you take title insurance on a property which was a landfill? Well, it was an easy title to insure. First and foremost, it had never been land, as we all know it, because it was underwater. And it was an act of Congress that was able, was the enabling act to allow for the landfill, which was the land, the, the turf, that was where the World Trade Center was, was constructed. So the, where they put all of that dirt was on this landfill, and they created this additional part of downtown New York City. So that was an easy title insurance. It was a very easy title insurance because there was no risk virtually because there was no historical records to really worry about. But you know we were talking But it was about land underwater right. but now it is no longer right. land but underwater. But then we were talking the other day about another interesting story. You know many people know about Roosevelt Field, you know Roosevelt Field shopping center yes. and then there's Roosevelt Raceway and at that time you talk about this because when you have title insurance you have these different things. There was James Orfanides with the DM, the dead man. Let's talk about that. It's okay. a great well, that's one of, one, one of my less noteworthy moments in my career. Um, I was um, I was handling this transaction for very good friends and clients. Uh, the law firm Cravath, Swain and Moore where it was the law firm representing an entity called Corporate Property Investors, which is now part of Simon de Bartolo organization. And we were closing on an expansion of Roosevelt Field, and I was both. The, the, the reader and the uh, clearance officer and also the closer in addition for being responsible for the business being at the firm. Um, and I noticed in the middle of the survey there was a reference to a DM and then I took, took a look at the legend and it said DM equals dead man. And I immediately got concerned with the possibility of an old cemetery plot or somebody being buried there. I, 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 I raised an issue. I said, wait a minute, we can't really do anything here. We may have to fence it off, uh, close it down. And this held up the closing for a considerable amount of time because people were all scurrying around trying to understand what had happened, how could we build a shopping center, pave over somebody's cemetery plot. Well, anyway. Uh, Unfortunately, uh, the story's ending was one of humiliation for me, but at least the deal closed and everybody was made content and happy when um, somebody said, look, let's get the surveyor on the phone and find out what re he really saw out there. So we got the surveyor on the phone, I forget who it was, and, um, and we asked him, I said, what's the story with this dead man that may be buried in the middle of the, the, the parking lot right behind the J.C. Penney site? And, uh, and the surveyor said, what dead man are you talking about? He said, the DM that's there. He said, that's not a dead man burial plot. That's a dead manhole from an old sewer line that existed 25, 30 years ago that ran through the property. Well, you can imagine the humiliation. And if I look red right now and, 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 and appear humiliated a little bit, it was not one of my greater moments. But, but the attorney that was in charge of the transaction, as everybody was really getting ready to be angry at me and frustrated at, at, at us, stood up and said, wait a minute, let's stop. Who in this room has not made a mistake as bad as Jim's? Although Jim's is pretty bad, that was one of those moments. Today, we have a lot of defaults. You know, in, in the 90s, there was something called, you know, collateralized mortgage debt securities. And you were sure. involved with the first securitization, uh, the first large securitization of the properties owned by Olympia in New York. Let's talk a little bit about well, that. Well, sure. That was a, at that time, I think we didn't really understand that there would be later on a whole business that was built around this concept and structure. Um, and this was uh, basically taking three mortgages. Uh, the properties were 237 Park, 2 Broadway, and 1290 Avenue of the Americas, which were owned by Olympia in New York. We were given the responsibility of being the lead title insurer, which was, this was such a large transaction, it basically and virtually took all of the title industry to be able to close and insure this deal. And there was co-insurance and reinsurance elements. And that's just part of our business practices. But uh, notwithstanding, it was a deal that was basically bundled in a single uh, homogenized mortgage effectively, cross the collateralized, cross defaulted. And it was the start of what became later on the birth of the commercial mortgage-backed securities industry, which was, at, uh, as we all know, I think when it, before it started to wane and disappear, as it now is not really, it's almost non-existent, had been up to $150 billion a year uh, fairly recently. So, uh, you know, from... And, and if we didn't have title insurance, we could have never done these deals. Well, because. these deals required that they be, that the vetting process included a title insurance product that at least secured and guaranteed, as the title policy would do in this case, a first lien priority. So that's... that's that's one of the reasons why we were very much uh, involved in that process. Then there was the interesting story about the foreign bank who didn't want, you know, uh, with, the, with the hotelier. 
Oh, okay. Well, yes. There was um, there's a, another story of a deal that was um, uh, a Midtown uh, hotel where uh, troubled uh, property that had gone through a defaulted owner. Uh, the bank was a European bank that was involved in, in the process. Uh, they had uh, attempted to foreclose. They were going through the foreclosure process. Uh, a person came in to buy the partnership interests out. They got a deed. There was all kinds of, 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 of issues that were um, hidden in the title and problematic. Everybody had taken a look at this for almost a year, year and a half, and no one would touch this deal. Um, much to the regret of, uh, of many of the people in my own company, uh, we made a business decision that we would work with the new developer, the new owner, and try to clear up and clean uh, the title and go through that whole process. Later on, six years later, five years later, they finally closed and cleaned up the title, and now it is in safe, safe hands. But I will say that the bank in Europe went through a major transformation. Uh, there were a few people that were further displaced that were in the process or had their hands on this file. So it was one of those typical stories that uh, behind the scenes, there's a lot of messy business practices and a lot of difficult real estate transactions that require sometimes just patience and steady guidance to work through as long as you have uh, everybody trying their best and working as hard as they can. You know, as I stated at the beginning of the show, without you, I wouldn't have the cre have the shows or the or the funding or, or all the the help that you've been there and you've been so instrumental in my life. But you've been very instrumental in other aspects because you've been an enabler. You know, you've en enabled a lot of people to a lot of things. And and you know, charitable. I mean, you're involved with the Greek Orthodox. You, you know, you're involved with Seeds of Peace. You know, let's talk about a little bit about Seeds of Peace. You know. Foundation for Medical Evaluation Early Detection, which is our favorite. You know, you know, you you've given back. You know, well, Michael, most I, I didn't give back as, as in a substantive way uh, directly to charities uh, uh, it, because I really didn't have the assets to do it with uh, in in the years, especially when my three children were all growing up and I was doing this. Don't forget, thing. we have the grandchildren and I and my three the, grandchildren. The names. Did. The names are uh, John. Anthony and Lily. Okay. Uh huh. And um, and they're terrific. I just went to my two grandsons moving up from three year old to four year old and four year old to kindergarten. So it was a pretty important event yesterday. But uh, but not, the uh, the story of, of of giving back was really defined after 9/11 took place, Michael. Uh, and I had realized that we had spent a lot of time, my wife and I, in New Jersey with New Jersey charities. I was at uh, the McCarter Theater. I was with the Princeton Symphony. I was at the Opera Festival of New Jersey. And while those are all worthwhile organizations, some of them are not around anymore, uh, the concept of giving back was something I learned with, with growing up in my house in Forest Hills. My mother made it clear to all three of my, my, my two brothers and myself, remember this, you're not taking anything with you when it's your time to go. So make sure you, you use it as wisely as you can and, 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 and do the right thing. And, and one of the things that was our, 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 our calling card for everything we did in life was always defined by, is this the right thing to do? And that was the guiding uh, uh, sort of like beam for all of the things that I've done in my life. And giving back after 9-11, when we had this uh, problem, it was, um, it was clear that I needed to, uh, to say New York is where I should be doing most of my philanthropies, and that's what has really blossomed since 2001, 9-11. And you truly have been a builder, a, a friend, an enabler, and I'm overjoyed that you've been on my show. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, First Service Williams, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Helmsley Spear, 
James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal & Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling & Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, The Moining Group.